a special moment for me. Uh, I first met our speaker, uh, Yona Popescu, I think eight or nine years ago when he was a, uh, a uh, lowly graduate student at Duke and I was uh, a uh, young professor here and I was giving a talk at Duke and I flew there and Yona picked me up at the airport. Um, so he was kind of my, my ride for that and a great great host there at Duke and he was just getting started in his doctoral studies. And it's really uh, something to have watched his life and career since then. So since that time when we met at Duke when he was a junior, uh, junior graduate student, he has gone on to finish his PhD from Duke in Political Science. Uh, he did a very successful postdoctoral fellowship with the Clement Center here at UT Austin. Uh, he got married, he became a father, he became a US citizen from his uh, Romanian background. He published a fantastic book, which you're gonna hear about today. Uh, he got a, a position, a tenure track position as an assistant professor at Texas State San Marcos uh, down the road. Um, so he's really kind of checked all the boxes in an incredibly fruitful 10 years uh, since that time. And meanwhile, since that time, I'm still a professor at UT. <laughs> anyway, it, uh, it puts me to shame, I'm afraid. So. Uh, seriously, it's a, it's a tremendous honor uh, to be hosting Yona because we at the Clement Center were able to play um, a supportive role uh, with his uh, scholarship and research in getting this book published. And with it, he's uh, developed a really sophisticated new way of thinking about grand strategy, about how American presidents uh, can, uh, can wield the power of our country in, in the world, uh, particularly on national security questions. Uh, so he's going to give us an overview of this excellent book, and then he will be available to uh, sell books and sign copies afterwards too. Right? So um, anyway, so please, uh, please join me in giving a warm Clement Center welcome to Yonah, Dr. Yona. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, Paul, Jennifer, Alex, for the staff at the Clement Center. I had such a fantastic year here, and uh, it's really, really great to be back. I miss you all. And uh, also, as someone who lives in Austin, it's kind of nice to be on campus for something else in a football game. <laughs> an appointment. Fun, that's a stack, really. So, as Will said, I'm here to talk about my <coughs> new book called Emerging Strategy and Grand Strategy. And uh, just to get right into it, the question that animates this book is why do presidents succeed in foreign policy? And uh, another version of this question would be how do they succeed? So what does it take to achieve foreign policy success? And upon doing those eight or nine years of research, Will was talking about the answer that came to me most often something along the lines of they are lucky. <laughs> and uh, this comes in a number of different forms. You can have your adversary do stupid things, like the Soviets invading Afghanistan, that certainly helped our grand strategy during the Cold War. You can be at the right place at the right time. If you think of, um, for example, George H.W. Bush, who is being praised, rightfully so, for managing the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall, it didn't have much to do with the fact that the Berlin Wall fell during his tenure. He was just there at a time when his particular managerial set of skills fit the moment, or you can catch a break. And again, if you think of the 1950s, there was a, doc a strategy document that's later been praised greatly by scholars called NSC 68, that according to many laid the foundation for the Cold War. The problem at the time was that the document itself, after having been produced, was basically ignored for being considered too expensive and for asking for increases in defense spending, the militarization of NATO, and other things that were just totally politically impossible. And therefore, President Truman did not adopt it. But then North Korea invaded South Korea. And that created such a political atmosphere inside the United States that allowed for the very hawkish conclusions of the document to actually impact policy in a way that otherwise would not have been possible. And this is not just a conclusion of later scholars. Dean Ashton, the Secretary of the State at the time, himself noticed how Korea came along and saved us. It may have been awkward phrasing given the many casualties and the cost of the Korean War, but that's what he meant, that the US grand strategy evolved in a way that had it not been for that particular incident would not have been possible. So, in some 
areas of life and disciplines, coming up with the correct answer is a good career enhancement prospect. In political science, you have to come up with a politically correct answer. So let's move on to another way of explaining why do they succeed. And that's the answer that's most often found that leaders follow the right grand strategy. And uh, therefore, leaders are praised when they have these long-term strategies and they implement them, particularly when they're successful. And conversely, they are criticized when they seem not to follow a grand strategy. And clearly, it would be too easy to mention all of the criticism that President Trump is taking for having seemingly erratic, chaotic style. But it didn't start with him. If you remember, President Obama was also accused of not having a grand strategy and of uh, making decisions in an improvised way, looking at short-term things, and uh, particularly when things went bad in the Middle East during the Arab Spring, there was a lot of commentary along the lines of if only Obama had a grand strategy, we could prioritize and we would not jump from one thing to another. Before him, President Bush, he was not criticized so much for not having a grand strategy, but for having the wrong grand strategy. So the argument was that his grand strategy of democratizing the Middle East by force or of um, preventing war led to the negative outcomes that many consider to have been uh, the legacy of the Bush administration. So even presidents who are in certain areas relatively successful, and I would put their Clinton's performance in Kosovo and in Yugoslavia were criticized at the time by scholars such as John Geddes for not having a grand strategy and using ad hoc improvisational learning. So even when the results are not that terrible, there's still this view that you need to have a grand strategy. So why is that? What does a grand strategy do for you? A number of things. As Professor Colin Dewey briefly summarize this narrative. It helps you prioritize foreign policy goals. It helps you identify existing and potential resources. And that, in turn, allows you to select a plan or a roadmap that uses those resources to meet set goals. And um, it all sounds very, very good. And there is one major example that's being offered, particularly in DC, but oftentimes in the academic world as well, of a successful implementation of such a model. And here you have George Cannon, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. <coughs> he is regarded as architect of the containment grand strategy during the Cold War. And as you can see from this picture, it kind of implies a calculus of our strengths and the strength of the Soviet Union. And uh, you have these documents, people refer to the long telegram, the X article that outline, according to the grand strategy narrative, the US goals and the path to contain the Soviet Union until its actual demise. And if I can read you just very briefly a couple of uh, quotes from the long telegram and the X article to see why Canon is credited with it, so the document reads, it is clear that the main element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of a long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. So this is arguably the passage that introduced this term containment and this concept into the strategic vocabulary, not that they're some policies weren't there in place to contain the Soviet Union before it, but this gave it a one-word definition that then became associated with and understood as the US grand strategy. And the second one is regarded by many as uh, foreshadowing of the end of the Cold War, and it reads, quote, the United States has in its power to increase enormously the strength under which Soviet policy must operate, the force upon the Kremlin a far greater degree of moderation and circumspection than it has had to observe in recent years, and in this way to promote tendencies which must eventually find their outlet in either the breakup or the gradual mellowing of Soviet power. 
So that's being regarded rightly in, uh, in many ways as foreshadowing this long 50 year process of uh, pressuring the Soviet Union until it, it collapses. And um, so what could, be, what could be wrong with that? A few things. First, the elements of containment that emerge in the years following these documents in many ways are at odds with Tennant's views of what containment should be. And the first such element is the issue of the Truman Doctrine, which just to remind you, refers to President Truman's declaration that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Truman went on to say, I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. Now, why did Cannon oppose the Truman Doctrine? It is because Cannon's view of containment was one based on balance of power considerations and based on regional emphasis on certain areas of, industrialized, of the industrialized world, while Truman's view was much more universal, much more based on US values. And as you can see, he talks about free people, and he talks about assisting, basically, countries that are facing communist insurgencies or, conversely, assisting anti-communist forces around the world that are facing communist regimes. Although, of course, not in the Eastern Bloc, but in the case of the Truman Doctrine, it had to do with Greece and Turkey. So the emergence of the Truman Doctrine itself came in an effort to persuade Congress to provide funds for Greece and Turkey. And um, therefore, many observers later said that Truman's rhetoric wasn't actually necessarily sincere. Maybe you've heard of uh, Dean Ashton being accused that he wanted to be clearer than the truth. And some critics of Truman argued that that was part of, uh, of this trying to sell it. But in my view, I think Truman and Ashton, I'm going to say in a second, were sincere. They're just, their strategy happened to be different than the one that Cannon laid out. And uh, what else? Cannon wanted a Marshall Plan that did not include Germany and the United Kingdom. And uh, if you believe that the Marshall Plan, as most scholars do, was a core contribution to containment, it is odd that the main architect, in his own advocacy of it, he listed eight nations that needed help, and three of them were never included, while he also listed eight nations that did not need the Marshall Plan, and five of them were, were eventually included. And the Marshall Plan itself, if you look at the memoirs of the second in command, Harlan Cleveland, was described as, quote, a series of improvisations, a continuous international happening. While a State Department <coughs> at the time compared it to, quote, a flying saucer, nobody knows what it looks like, how big it is, in what direction it is moving, or whether it really exists. So it's important not to have too much mythology for uh, this idea that Back in that day, we really had it all figured out, and it's only recently that governments are, uh, are chaotic. <coughs> and last, perhaps most importantly, Cannon not only opposed the formation of NATO, but actually fought against it. And that goes back again to his view of uh, a balance of power situation in which he argued our best answer is to strengthen in every way local forces of resistance and persuade others to bear a greater part of the burden of opposing communism. The present bipolarity will, in the long run, be beyond our resources. In other words, he wanted to do, he wanted to have the Europeans basically defend itself and do more. It's kind of like Trump ahead of his time, if you're still parallel. And uh, what Ken wanted was to offer a unilateral guarantee, much like the true, much like the Monroe Doctrine, as opposed to this formal commitment <coughs> and uh, international organization. So, basically, we are left to conclude that Ken hated the actual containment strategy that emerged, and no wonder later on he rejected the label of the architect of containment, and in later years, he often 
was a critic of Cartagena for, for good reason because as I am trying to show in the book this was not the strategy that he, he emphasized except for the notion that he, rather than going to war against the Soviets or allowing them to run Russia over the world, we should contain them, find this middle path. But as far as what should be contained, for Cannon that was the Soviet Union, for Truman, and later on for many administrations, including Reagan's, was communism, two different things, I mean, parallel, related but different. How to do it? Again, Cannon, he had a lot of emphasis on psychology, Clearly, the U.S. containment policy involved a lot more military force. Later on, the Kennedy was comfortable with on the issue of where to do it, whether it be regional or global, and on the issue of what role the United States should play in it, a main role or just as a balancer. On all of those questions, I would argue the outcome of the containment strategy in practice was different than what uh, what Kennedy outlined. So, if he didn't plan it, then who did? You may hear the argument that, as I was saying earlier, NSC 68 and Paul Nitsi, which was the author of NSC 68, represents the, the actual blueprint, as some scholars have called it, for containment. But this is also unsatisfying. And the reason why is that NSC 68, which is the document I was referencing at the beginning of my talk, was based on a view of the threat of international communism coming from what the document called, I think 20 or 25 times, a Kremlin designed to impose absolute authority over the end of the world, over all of the world. And so it has this monolithic view of communism being controlled by the Kremlin, and such a view, while plausible, even though not entirely correct in the 19th 50s when the document was written, by the time of the Sino-Soviet split and the 70s and 80s, clearly it was not a view that had any semblance to the actual reality. So while NSC 68 helped adopt certain policies at the very beginning of the Cold War, it would be a great overstatement to argue that it provided this blueprint for, uh, for fighting the Cold War and winning it given how uh, bad it, some of the main predictions lie. The, the document also talked about this period of maximum danger where the US and the Soviet Union are likely to involve, get themselves involved into a nuclear conflict. So th there were a whole bunch of things there that just did not happen in, uh, in the next years. And therefore, it would be difficult to say that this was a blueprint given how many things happened differently. And um, so I don't think that's the right answer. Could it be that no one planned it? After all, that was Cannon's view. He wrote in his memoirs that American policies in World War II was not based on, based on any global plan. So it owed much to a great deal of improvisation. So the answer I'm going to suggest today was that there was a strategy, but may not have been what we think of as a grand strategy. It was this idea of emergent strategy. And before I do that, let me talk to you a little bit about Dean Ashton, who was in another shaper of the containment strategy. He was Secretary of State. But between 1949 and 1953, he was also Deputy, Assistant, Deputy Secretary of State before that, and was involved in, in all of these major decisions. And he actually did shape the Truman Doctrine and NATO in a way that was much closer to what those policies end up being in, in practice. So his speeches emphasize the ideological nature of the threat and the universal nature of the Cold War much more than much more than Kenneth did. And uh, as I'm going to argue in a second, he also was the one who helped shape this strategy, not just at the conceptual level, but in practice. And this is why I talk about Dean Ashton getting things done. And this expression comes from a quote from Dean Ashton, who was once asked by a reporter, what is your strategy, Secretary Ashton? And he said, every once in a while, you have to give a speech. So you take a look at what you've been doing in the past few months, you write it out, and that's your strategy. 
doesn't really sound like a grand strategy, but it may well be what <coughs> best approximates this uh, this thing. So, in another instance, he said the thing to do was to just get on, do what had to be done as quickly and as effectively as you could. Now, this kind of quote is why grand strategy historians such as John Geddes are critical of Atchison because this doesn't look like matching means and ads and thinking far ahead. It looks more like just acting short term and hoping it all works out. Now, my favorite metaphor from this comes from a friend of Will's, his father, Bill Miss Campbell, who wrote that Canon works more like Plato, preoccupied with ideal forms than greedy reality, while Addison was more like Aristotle, focusing on the world as it was, adapting as necessary to get things done. And therefore, we're left with this puzzle of how to explain these strategic successes despite Dean Addison most clearly not being a grand strategist in a common understanding of it. And this, at this point, I moved away from the grand strategy model from the National Security Scholarship, and I looked for other ways of explaining strategic success. And lo and behold, there I came across this paradigm of emergent strategy <coughs> that comes from the business world, most specifically the business consulting world, where company, firms like McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group have adopted a series of theories about achieving strategic success, not based on long-term plans, but based on learning, adaptation, and improvisation. In this view, the strategist is more of a power recognizer and a learner, not a designer. And uh, therefore, you have successes that came along in the business world where these theories were developed, not as part of long-term plans, but as part of a series of improvisation that what they call emerge into a successful strategy. I'm going to give you two brief examples here of Honda, and in particular their uh, entrance into the motorcycle market in the United States in the 60s, which is one of the case studies business scholars <coughs> wrote about because it compares this view of a design strategy. Basically, Honda had a strategy based on their analysis of the US market that anticipated that demand for large bikes, the 305 cubic centimeters, you see black leather, very macho market, and they introduced these small cycles in the US market, and then they totally crashed, literally and figuratively, because roads in the US are larger, and American bikers drive bikes faster and longer, so they started to, to have a lot of maintenance problems, and uh, basically they were on their way to failing when something unexpected happened. Basically, one of the Honda dealers was riding around town in a super cup, one of those small 50 cubic centimeters bikes, and uh, a seller from a Sears store saw, saw him and asked him to sell those super cups in Sears. And initially, the Honda strategist argued that no, our strategy is to focus on uh, a different segment of the market and to focus on selling through dealerships, not stores. This is not really what we're about. But because their strategy was going so bad, they gave it a shot. And sure enough, in a few years, they moved from this strategy to this strategy. You meet the nicest people on a Honda, and the Super Cup became a bestseller, and they took over half of the US motorcycle market, focusing on that smaller, uh, smaller motorcycle. Another quick example is something you may be familiar with. Google started as a search engine. And uh, according to a history of Google, the organization basically is best described as an evolutionary organization. From that search engine, it moved into ad revenues, and then it moved into putting ads to the pages that you are accessing through this technology called AdSense, which they actually developed accidentally while they were working on Gmail inboxes, trying to match the ads to your inbox messages, but afterwards they also 
figure out that not only can they match it with their searches, but also can they match it, match the ads with whatever page you're on. And then they start develop Google Apps and other projects. And basically today they invest in hundreds of disparate ideas ranging from self-driving cars to cell phones to software without any specific long-term plan other than to capitalize on quote unquote the next big thing. So here you have some of Google's businesses which as you can see is YouTube, Google Health, they have Google Fiber of course, right here in Austin where you may have seen it. And the core principle of it is to experiment with a lot of different things and uh, focus on, uh, on what works. Now, that may be fine for the business world, but could it really be applied to national security? Is there anything to it? And uh, here I'm starting from a way to understand strategy that is a little different than, than the traditional understanding of it, and that is both a plan, but also as a pattern of action. And uh, the definition there is one that I like a lot from Drew Erdman, who, in addition to being a uh, historian and a former government official also spent a lot of time at uh, McKinsey as a partner. So he defines strategy as being made from decisions and actions, not plans. Not that you don't have plans, but strategy is also coming through this process of making. <coughs> okay, so we got to the point where uh, I'm ready to introduce you and to live in a second this schools of thought that I'm examining in the book and uh, the predictions of them you have down on the screen basically the way I, I go about in the book is to look at the series of presidents and then see which prediction or hypothesis if you're what the science minded bears more fruit so is it true that the more successful strategies came out of thought, the most successful results I'm so, sorry came out of pursuing a grand strategy or were the most successful foreign policies shaped by emerging learning and short-term adaptation. And the case studies I'm looking at in the book, I will already mention Canon and Containment at the beginning of the Cold War, and then uh, going on through not all presidents, but the presidents which, in my view, either attempted specifically to, to develop a grand strategy and implement it, or presided over important strategic shifts in U.S. foreign policy, whether planned or unplanned. And uh, <coughs> I'll be happy during the during the Q and A to take questions on uh, any any of them that you have an interest on. In, but now, in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk a little bit about the Ronald Reagan and the end of the Cold War chapter. So I'm going to skip over Eisenhower and. Kissinger again, if you want to ask questions about that, we can go back. But uh, I'll talk about Reagan because Reagan is someone that is being regarded by some people as a successful grand strategist, by others as a successful emerging strategist, and yet by others as just being lucky and being successful despite himself. So, you know, with success having many fathers and whatnot, uh, Reagan is interpreted in a, in a variety of different ways. And uh, let me give you my, my brief take on it. So clearly the Reagan administration aimed to uh, develop the Grand Strategic Plan in fact two, and as they did 32 and 75, the first one a more broader US national security strategy, the second one referring directly to the, to the Soviet Union and uh, the key concept here, I would argue, was this move from containment towards rollback. And what I mean by that is as NSDD 75 reads, quote, the US will contain and reverse the expansion of Soviet control and military presence in the world. This was the work of Richard Pipes, who authored and the and as it is 75, the second one he was also involved heavily in uh, other administration speeches. And in Richard Pipe's view, as he wrote in his memoirs, the important distinction there was to change Soviet system 
not just Soviet behavior. Because he argued that Soviet Union's aggressiveness comes from its very system, not from its, uh, its behavior. And that was, in my view, one of the main innovations and one of the main goals outlined in this, in this strategy documents. And uh, how did the Reagan administration go about implementing it, and why do many, many scholars believe that Reagan was successful in implementing this strategy? Number of ways. First, Reagan launched the military buildup and the strategic defense initiative, which, particularly as far as the SDI, the strategic defense initiative, is concerned, led the Soviets to invest a lot of their very sparse resources at the time in their defense industry and arguably helped bankrupt the, the Soviet Union more so than any other action that uh, the Reagan administration took. And uh, as you know, there, there is that quip that the only people who believe in SDI were Reagan and Gorbachev which as far as the answer is concerned is good enough because if Gorbachev believed it, uh, their uh, there are reasons to believe that he did, then the goal of uh, getting the Soviet Union to invest much in the resources to try and keep up with the United States was, was successful. And some of the evidence from that comes from Gorbachev himself, who argued that SDI could put the Soviets at a quote, permanent strategic disadvantage. And uh, he was worried about getting into an arms race that we will lose, that is the Soviet's will. And the former Soviet ambassador, Anatoly Dobrynin, recalled in his memoirs, quote, our leadership was convinced that the great technical potential of the United States has scored again and treated Reagan's statement as a real threat. So SDI is one of the, one of the important uh, reasons why Reagan's grand strategy is considered a success, I, I would argue. Now, of course, SDI was not aimed solely at that. It was also aimed, in Reagan's mind most clearly, at this issue of nuclear abolition, of using SDI to eventually get rid of the nuclear weapons. And uh, that's not in NSD 75. In fact, the authors of NSD 75 were quite opposed to that. And uh, that's something to keep in mind as, as we'll go along. But let me continue the case of Reagan and successful grand strategies. That second component, which was in NSD 75, was economic warfare, efforts to limit Soviet access to Western technology and hard currency. Just moving right along. Ideological warfare, extremely important as far as Reagan's rhetoric and Reagan's efforts through the National Endowment for Democracy, the promotion of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and Voice of America, through covered aid to solidarity workers, and uh, through his speeches in Notre Dame, the Westminster Address, just basically making the case for freedom and for the superiority of US values, which by all evidence had a significant impact in bringing down the, the Soviet Union. And that again comes flows very neatly from the strategy documents. And so does the Reagan doctrine of supporting anti-communist forces around the world and trying not just to play defense but also play offense. And uh, you know this was part of what justified the help to Don Jacket in Afghanistan and other such forces around the world. So if this is Reagan the grand strategist, then is there a place for Reagan the emergent strategist? And here I would say that the Cold War had ended in 1985 as opposed to 1989, the grand strategy narrative would be almost foolproof. However, I argue Reagan made a series of consequential decisions in his second term that helped bring about the successful outcome of the Cold War, but were not shaped by his early plans. And in fact, they may have even run counter to some of the principles outlined in those plans. And uh, here I have in mind mostly the summits with Mikhail Gorbachev. And we're getting here into this debate of a second term shift or reversal. Basically, the idea being that if you look at 
Reagan's diplomacy with the Soviet Union in the second term. He, particularly his efforts to reach nuclear abolition, as I was mentioning earlier, that does not in any way flow from the NSDD 75 design that argued for strengthening of nuclear deterrence. And Reagan's rhetoric himself, for example, in 1983, he referred to the Soviet Union as evil empire, while in 1988 declared that, I was talking about a different time, another era. <coughs> or if you're looking at the Reykjavik meeting where Reagan adopted a far different tone than that of NSDD 32, for example, by saying, we harbor no hostile intentions toward the Soviets, and uh, according to a stepper, we recognize the differences in the two systems, but the president felt that we could live as friendly competitors. So this is a little different than the uh, identifying the Soviet system as the main problem. And you, the argument could be made that the Soviet system of 1988 is different than the one in 1983 in a significant enough way that Reagan was not inconsistent, or you could argue that he had this, this second term reversal, which some historians did. So basically, there are these three ways to look at Reagan at the end of the Cold War, and uh, until Professor Imboden finishes his book and solves this debate for good, we're going to have to keep arguing about that. Okay, so just to give you a quick sense of where the case studies fall, basically, I find both grand strategic successes and failures, and I found both emergent strategy successes and emergent strategy failures, which leads to the conclusion of, so when to use one or the other. Clearly, it's not the case that all successes or failures are on the one side. And here I have just four tentative ideas, which this gets into more political science, so I won't spend too much time, but four ways in which I think would be helpful, like rule of thumb, look at uncertainty, and basically how confident are you that in 30 years, when your grand strategy might be applying, the world will be in a way that you can predict right now. I mean, no, for Kennan, it was true. Basically, he predicted a decades-long fight against the Soviet Union, which is pretty much what, what was it. But <coughs> if you believe that you shouldn't have enough confidence in this particular point in time that 30 or 40 years we are going to be in a place that we can predict now as far as our main challenges, then perhaps a more emergent approach would be, would be more uh, recommended. And that gets into the time horizon issue. Also for a grand strategy <coughs> function, you need you know, broad popular support because by definition, if it's a multi-generational struggle, it involves both multiple parties. So if you could achieve bipartisan consensus, at least at the broadest possible level, on what the threat is, a grand strategy may be more successful than if you don't. And lastly, some presidents are just better at deliberate strategic planning by virtue of how they operate, and others are better at providing. And the last slide, so just to go into the Q&A, what does it mean in terms of President Trump? So as you know, President Trump said, among many things, that he's a very flexible person. But the question is, can he learn and adapt, which is the key condition for an emergent successful strategy. And here, this changes by the day, but I find mixed evidence so far. <coughs> things he did not change much on, trade, democracy, promotion, or using Twitter. Things he changed somewhat, <laughs> Afghanistan, the Syria strike, NATO. And it's unclear, at least to me, whether Russia and North Korea, whether he's, um, he's evolving or not. But I'll be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. So lastly, I'll leave you with this quote from one of the great grand strategists, Henry Kissinger, who nevertheless wrote, in retrospect, all successful policies seem preordained. Leaders like to claim free science for what has worked, ascribing to planning what usually starts as a series of improvisations. And with that, Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to your questions.